My guest today is one of the country's most accomplished and sought after mental health specialists. Dr. Christian Conti, welcome to the show. I have come to this profound conclusion that the world boils down to two kinds of people, Lee. There are people who have issues and dead people. <laughs> <laughs> and we talk about inner peace. This is something that I believe that many of our viewers are looking for. Whatever you're going through, no matter how intense it ever gets, there will be. A Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Brought to you by Lean Body, the number one protein shake in gyms across America. Welcome back, you guys. As you know, my show is about helping you improve your physical, mental, and spiritual health. And that's why we bring on experts that can help us to improve in these areas. If you like the channel and the guests that we bring on here, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And please comment. I love to get feedback from you guys, so make sure to leave your comments below. My guest today is one of the country's most accomplished and sought after mental health specialists. There's a lot that we can learn from him. He's an expert on motivation, inspiration, and self-control. He said that his goal is to bring insight to people. Dr. Christian Conti is a licensed professional counselor with over 20,000 hours of clinical mental health counseling experience, working with everyone from everyday people to celebrities to pro athletes, sports teams, you name it. He helps people not only reach their goals, but also helps people struggling with anxiety and anger. Among his many achievements, he co-hosted the show, Coaching Bad, on Spike TV with NFL great Ray Lewis, he also co-hosted the reality show, The Secret Life of Kids on USA Network, and is the resident therapist for family therapy on VH1. Dr. Christian Conti, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I cannot say, I, I can't say thank you enough. I'm really honored and humbled to be here. I, uh, I get to meet a lot of people in my career, but I mean, you're somebody whose picture I had up uh, in my gym growing up as just inspiration. So for me, it's a real honor to be here with you. Well, the, the honor is all mine. Dr. Conte, you're known for always wishing people much peace. Can mm -hmm. we talk about inner peace? This is something that I believe that many of our viewers are looking for. Most definitely. I think one of the easiest ways I say it is in a little tale. Because people say, what, what is this peace? Is this like sitting around a fire, holding hands, singing kumbaya? And uh, that, that might be a nice thought. But that's not the peace that I talk about. Uh, you know, there's a really quick tale I, I share this with. There was a king. He wanted to know what peace was. He was like, what is this peace? And so he said, I'm going to have a contest. I want somebody to paint me peace. I want a picture of it. Well, there were people all through the land gave him submissions of angels, saints, flowers, nice little serene, calm pictures. But amongst all these paintings, there was one painting of a ship at sea. And my goodness, it was in the middle of a storm. Well, the people put on the contest, they were embarrassed. They said, man, this painting should be in here, sir. I'm sorry. But the king, he, he said, no, 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 let me see it. So he looks at this picture and he sees the chaos everywhere. People are screaming, barrels are flying off the ship. But what he noticed was there was a bird sitting perched on the bow of the ship amongst all that chaos. And when he looked into that bird's eyes, he saw a sense of stillness and inner calmness. And so the king declared that painting the winner, that one exemplified piece and Lee, to me, that's what peace is. It's not controlling the outside world. It's being able to control your inner world, regardless of what's going on around you. That's the peace I try to help people find. Dr. Connie, how do you control your inner world? Do you have certain steps or certain you know, procedures you go through? Most definitely. So as you know, we, we put so much effort into what we do in life. And it doesn't, it's not a quick fix. It's not a magic pill. It is practice over a long period of time. But probably the fastest route to controlling your internal world begins with accurate language. Accurate language. So uh, just a quick example. For most people, someone cuts you off in traffic and you say, I can't stand that when somebody <laughs> does this, right? Maybe a few choice words. Yeah, a few choice words. But what's fascinating is if you really think about that statement, you're saying, I can't stand it, but you can stand it. You, you, you do stand it all right. the time. And so by telling yourself, I can't stand it, you cause your fight or flight response to go off. And now it's like, I've got a, I've, if you really can't stand something and you're backed against a corner, you've got to come out swinging. 
And I think what people um, unfortunately haven't been taught, honestly, is that you put yourself in a psychological corner constantly when you use extreme words. So what I try to do is just shine a light to help people recognize to use accurate language to themselves. For example, well, this car um, is driving slower than I want it to be going. <laughs> That's a big difference. <laughs> so there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's amazing. You you are an amazing guy. You know, I I uh, am really fascinated with uh, everything that you've done and how many people you've helped in so many diverse areas. Let's talk about you for a moment. Can you tell us your story? Well, uh, look, when I was young, uh, my dad he was an earth scientist, and he said uh, I asked him. I said. I was a hothead, know-it-all teenager, and I said to my dad, what do you like about like geology? Like, why, why study earth science? And my dad said to me, well, if you only live on one planet your entire life, don't you think you ought to get to know it? And I, whew, that was a great answer, right? So I was like, that's amazing. Now, for me, when I got, went to school and I was trying to figure out what to study, I thought about my dad's advice, but just slightly differently. I thought, well, if I'm only going to ever live with me my entire life, don't I think I ought to get to know myself? So I just dived into psychology and I was fascinated by, it. I mean, our psyches are absolutely endless. There's so much inside each and every one of us. It's a universe within. So to be able to explore the depths of our undiscovered psyches, I think that's a fascinating lifelong pursuit. Um, and then I played sports growing up. I love sports. I hit a home run the College World Series. Um, and uh, I, I like to sneak that in there because I didn't make it as a professional. Um, but I did get to play college baseball and I loved it. Um, and then when I didn't make it as a professional athlete, what I did is I took all that effort into, um, that I put into working out and my athletic career and I put that into my studies. And I just I read five books a week for years and I just really, I wanted to understand and help people and not just help people through the context of my own experiences, but really meet them where they were and help them, you know, learn from wherever they were from that moment forward. So that's how I kind of got into psychology. I loved mental health. I do sports psychology, but I do it all because um, I just, I'm really fascinated by human beings and I, I, you know, as you mentioned, 20,000 hours, I think I quit counting years ago, but I 20, this has been 25 years. January will be 26 wow. years of me doing this work. Wow. And um, just, but, so I, I'll tell you this, I'd love to get this in early. So I've met with thousands of people from all over the world. It's, it's humorous, but this is true. So I, I meet with celebrities. I meet with some of the best athletes in the world, work with some of the best athletes in the world. Um, I work with people in maximum security prisons. I specialize in violence. Um, so from wherever I've worked with people, whether it's the comfortable Zen setting of a home office or standing at a cell door in a maximum security prison, working with celebrities on TV, I have come to this profound conclusion that the world boils down to two kinds of people, Lee. There are, there are people who have issues and dead people. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's so we all have issues. So I've never looked at it like I'm here and someone else is there. Like I just look at it. We're all in this together. Um, each of us can provide insight for others um, when we're not in the situation. And look, when issues collide, conflict arises. Conflict is natural. We, you know, I specialize work with people convicted of violent crime. So I've, I've worked with uh, many men who have done violent things that later on, like, especially let's say in domestic violence where later on when they finally get an awareness they realize they had never been taught how to handle this so we go from one extreme to another either be really passive or really aggressive but and you know this with your discipline everything you've done like there's a way to be assertive there's a way to be assertive without being aggressive and that's a lot of what i teach many people i love that and it's so true you you have to uh you have to learn to love serving others and the, mm. the, the irony uh, is that you get so much out of that, just as much as the person you're helping. Most definitely. So I, I, that's, that's a great way to phrase it because I remember w w one of the things I loved about sports, like I was a quarterback in high school and throwing a touchdown pass, what a feeling, you know, hitting a home run what in baseball, what a feeling. Um, but what I found early on in my counseling career was – when I was able to help someone gain insight that they never had before, 
I actually had the same feeling of running around the bases or throwing a touchdown. It was a, it was like, wow, this, I helped this person gain insight. And that was awesome. So I, I felt a lot of efficacy from, from diving into it. And I learned that it's not a matter of, you, you know, it's not that I get my self worth from helping someone. It's not that because if someone's doing well, it's because they're doing well. Sure. And if someone's not doing well, it's because they're not doing well. But it is my job to give people my absolute best and then let go. But I also think it's okay to recognize that you're absolutely right. It feels good to be able to help people and do the right thing. Like that, to me, that honestly just feels good. You have dedicated your life to helping people to master themselves. And I've heard you say, we master what we practice. What do you mean by that? So it's, it's, it's so interesting because I speak all over the country and I'll ask an audience, I'll say, you know, how many of you are parents and the hands shoot up and I'll say, what do you tell your children if they want to be good at sports? And they're all practice. What do you tell them if they want to be good at music? Practice. All right. We know we master what we practice, but what we fail often to recognize is that we are mastering whatever we're practicing, which means that if we're in a habit of complaining a lot, um, we become a master complainer. If we, you know, if we practice not being kind to others, that's what we get really good at. If we practice not accepting responsibility for the part we play in situations, that's what we get really good at. And so I just try to shine a light or hold a mirror up for people to say, be mindful what you're practicing because you are getting really good at it. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. And so as people practice, you know, uh, and and they keep improving, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it, eventually you're going to run into obstacles, challenges, right? Because it's a it's a lifelong journey, you know, mastering yourself. So what do you do when you encounter obstacles in your life? So. I really believe if you ask anyone, you know, you do in the podcast, you do, you meet lots of people and it's so fascinating. But if you ask people about their lives, they often tell you about obstacles that they've overcome. Each of us knows that part of the reason why we are who we are today is because of the obstacles we were able to overcome. So to me, it's fascinating that when we encounter obstacles, we break down because when I encounter obstacles, I think this is awesome. This is going to add to my character and the story of who I am in the future. So instead of looking at obstacles as, oh, this is terrible, I say, good, this is going to teach me something. This is going to teach me a new lesson about something. In fact, I heard, um, I, I believe it was David Goggins that said it, which He's just an amazing human being. You watch David Goggins. He was, uh, he was a uh, Navy SEAL guy who's just incredible motivator. But I think I heard him talk about it once where he's like, good, there's an obstacle, good. And I love the way he phrased it <laughs> because it resonated with me. I'm like, that makes sense. I When I'm in traffic and then I'm late and something happens and it's testing my patience, good, great. How am I supposed to get good at patience if I don't have obstacles? weightlifting is an awesome example. If you go in and you use the same weight you used when you were 10 and you never changed the weight, how are you going to get stronger? That's right. If you have to get obstacles. Like your purpose, this is what's wonderful about like a life that you've carved out and led by example. You constantly challenged yourself literally daily by putting on more weights, by giving yourself more of a challenge. And so I think that's what successful people do. They find ways to embrace the challenges rather than duck from them. And honestly, Lee, one of the most common things I hear people say is, oh yeah, but I like it if it's this challenge. No, the point is you don't get to pick out the obstacle. <laughs> if you get to pick it out, it's too easy. That's right. Like we're, It's what life brings you and are you prepared for it? Samurai warriors prepared for anything they would encounter, not, hey, I encountered this, but no, you picked up a tree branch. That's not what I'm prepared for. <laughs> right. got to be prepared for anything that comes our way. That's right. And uh, and one way of looking at those challenges and those obstacles as they come up is, you know, I mean, just basically reframing and saying, I get to, I get to do this particular challenge. I get to work through this particular obstacle and I'm going to emerge better and stronger as a result. Now, a lot of us, you know, they start, uh, we start with the resolve, uh, you know, whether it's going in the gym to uh, change our bodies or, or whatnot, we, we start with the resolve to do something. 
you know, but some of us lose what we call motivation along the way. How do you teach your clients to stay motivated and, uh, and, and stay in it for the long run? Yeah, I, I think that we have to keep what we really want in our foreground. So it's nice, like you said, it's nice to come up with a goal and be like, okay, this is what I want. But if the when it gets hard, if you immediately start thinking, now you're thinking this is hard. If you're really thinking about your goal, you're, you're overlooking this, this difficult and you're going, I'm trying to get there. Uh, for me, it's consistently coming back to the bigger picture. It's the bigger picture. And I'll tell you what, here's, here's my bigger picture. It comes from a gnat. Listen, a gnat is the reason why I do what I do. <laughs> I always say enlightenment can come from anyone, anywhere, at any time. And if we're looking for it, it can, right? So for a gnat, you know, a tiny little gnat. All right, so there was a gnat and he fell asleep on this bull's horns. And so he woke up from his nap and he was like, oh, Mr. Bull, I'm so sorry. I, I fell asleep. And the bull was like, I didn't even know you were there. Listen, when I heard that story many, many years ago, Lee, when I heard that story, it like I had chills go through my body because this story impacted my entire life. I said to myself, I will never leave this earth with the earth saying, I didn't even know you were there. Like, I'm going to make a fire. I wake up with a fire under me to say, I want to make an impact on this world so the world knows I was here and, and, and a positive impact on the world so the world knows I was here. And I think for me, I found that motivation. So I wake up with a fire to impact the world. I, you know, I do a meditation very first thing in the morning, first with gratitude, um, always grateful just to be alive. I think keeping gra gratitude in the foreground will change everything. And this isn't just words, like this is literally doing this every day. I do a, a meditation for every living being first thing in the morning. And when you, when you do something like this, what I have found is it sets my mind on something so much bigger than my immediate problems, the immediate discomfort, um, the immediate things that aren't going exactly the way I'd like them to go. And by focusing again on that bigger goal, you it can really impact your day to day motivation. Yeah, that's really uh, that's really uh, uh, amazing. You know, and I have seen firsthand the uh, improvements that people can make in the quality of their life. You know, by uh, you know by meditating. You know, and and focusing and 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 such. It's uh, it's uh, very very impactful. Doctor Connor, you said that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to every emotional experience that you have. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think this is probably one of the most powerful lessons that I get to share with the world. And that is this, no matter what you're going to, and I'm speaking to every human being who hears this, whatever you're going through, no matter how intense it ever gets, there will be a beginning, a middle, and an end to that emotional experience. Your emotions inevitably come and go, but your actions can't be undone. Your words can't be unsaid. You know, uh, Ray Rice was a, was got notoriety. He knocked his wife out. It was on camera in a Las Vegas hotel. Oh my goodness! He was a running back. I remember from Baltimore Ravens. His life was going well, and after that, after that experience and all the consequences he went through. He goes around, he teaches young people, it takes one decision to turn a dream into a nightmare. And when I, 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 so I had a group, when people in the state of California commit a violent crime, when they get out of prison or jail, they're then sentenced to 52 weeks of anger management. And they, you know, they can't get out of this. This is like three unexcused absences for the whole year. So I literally, my career is basically around people who really don't want to meet me or be around me at first. Like I spend so much time with mandated people, right? But so when I get to this, a lot of times people will be like, so I would bring interns up. I was a professor at the University of Nevada. So I taught master's students, doctoral students who wanted to become therapists, counselors, that kind of thing. So inevitably, when I would bring up an intern to sit in on this group, I would hear this uh, kind of almost verbatim. At the end, of the first thing the interns would usually say to me is, um, man, doc, they didn't seem like what I thought they would be like. And I'll say, what did you think they were going to be like? 
And so the vision of people committing violent crimes is often like a big scary guy or whatever. But what they found was that violence doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter what your background is, your culture. Like violence is everywhere. And so when you sit and you realize that no matter where people come from, if they don't have self-control, that it can quickly move into anger, can quickly turn into violence. And the reason why this is important to understand is this. Time after time, people that committed violent crimes will come back and say, I'm so much more than this event, but this is how I'm defined. And the challenge is, the unfortunate reality is, it does take a moment. But think about what would happen if you sat through that discomfort. Somebody challenges your ego and really burns. And listen, when people challenge our egos, that is a, as real to our brains neurologically as a bear running in the room. So, so it can feel like you have to defend yourself until you learn, no, I'm not going to die if somebody attacks my ego and, and you know threatens my ego. That's not, I'm not going to die from that. But it takes training to get there. It sure does. So what happens is people get these moments and they think this moment is the end all be all. Then they do something and now they have lifelong consequences because they couldn't sit with the discomfort of handling that difficult emotion. That's why I spend so much time teaching people. And I'm glad you brought that up because it is one of the most powerful lessons I believe I, I try to share with the world is no matter what you're going through, there will be a beginning, a middle and an end to it. I promise you that. Listen, when I speak, everywhere I go, when I speak, I love doing that. I always tell people um, the human attention span is eight minutes. So I'm, I knock, <laughs> clap, I That's tap, out. I do a bunch of stuff. And, and I always say this because in eight minutes, even if you like what I'm saying, you're going to be sitting on a beach sipping a Mai Tai in your mind somewhere. And I say, go, go along with the adventure. adventure. Have fun. It's my job. Tap, knock, get you back into it. That's but a, the good that's news. A, very very <laughs> interesting. Funny. Very it's, interesting insight. Very interesting. It, yeah. It's true. It's true. So, but, but the reason why I say that too is then now let's think about this, Lee. If somebody's struggling with intense anger, they're really hurt. They're really sad. What I, the reason why it's good to be armed with this information about human nature, about the human brain, is that means in the midst of that sadness, at some point, you're going to think, man, I got to pee. And <laughs> it might just be a little thing, but eventually <laughs> you're going to break up that intensity. Sure. And if I can reach in young people's hearts and have them see that, then they won't be so reactive or impulsive the moment they encounter tough emotions. You know, at, uh, speaking of, of uh, tough emotions, uh, yeah, uh, the mind and how it always seems to uh, you know, be uh, running a dialogue, I've heard you say that your mind always wants to match your body. I'm, I'm not sure that I completely understand that. Can, can you explain that to us? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just, listen, I got to tell you, I always tell people life's not a movie. So if you think something about someone and you want to tell somebody, tell them, because it's not like they can see the background of that movie. I always tell people, tell your loved ones, thank you. And I, I have to just take a moment and say, I'm so honored that you um, uh, have dialed into some of my work. Um, I just, I'm really, it blows me away. So I appreciate that you pay attention to my work enough to well, see your 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 mind. Your work is amazing, and and I can clearly see how many people can benefit from your work. You know, so to me, it's just an honor that you're here with us today, sharing your wisdom. I, I think it's just going to be so impactful for everybody that's viewing. Man, I really thank you very much. Honestly, thank you. So the mind matching your body is something that I realized years ago when I was working with people. So I was trained with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is just a wonderful approach to therapy. It, it teaches you that it sounds fancy for people who aren't familiar with it, but honestly, cognitions are thoughts, behaviors are your actions. So cognitive behavioral therapy teaches you that it's not the outside world that causes you to feel how you do. It's what you tell yourself about the outside world that causes you to feel the way you do. So I love that. I saw that thoughts really do impact our actions. The difference between cognitive behavioral therapy and yield theory, the approach I created is this. One of the primary differences is exactly what you're talking about, mind matching the body. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, you say, well, your thoughts determine how you feel. 
I say your thoughts impact how you feel, but your mind wants to match your body. Here's what I mean. Let's say um, you and I and everyone listening, we all down three energy drinks. Don't do it. This is just a thought experiment. <laughs> but let's say we down three energy drinks. So here's what will happen. Your heart will start racing. Your body might even tremble a little bit. And your body will physiologically mimic what anxiety is. And so when your body's feeling anxious because of the excess uh, caffeine, excess adrenaline, cortisol going through your body, when your body's feeling anxious, your mind will then race to make up a story to match why you feel the way you do. And memory cues in the brain will have your brain seeking a memory or a situation that will most clearly explain why you're feeling like you do. So again, you down three energy drinks, you start feeling anxious, and then your mind says, did I send that email? Oh, did I call so-and-so? Did we finish paying that bill? Or for some people who are crisis prone, they might immediately go to a crisis. Um, we never did finish that argument from three weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> And it's instantly your mind races to make a story up to make sense out of how you feel. And the reason why this might seem subtle but is so incredibly profound is this. Imagine the freedom, imagine the change in your daily relationships if you don't run with whatever story your mind makes up and instead you take a moment to be mindful. I say step outside your body and almost look in and say, oh, this guy had too much caffeine rather than running with the story. And then I could say something. Let's say my wife and I, we've been married 23 years. It'll be 24 here in November. Congratulations. And thank you very much. And we're happier now than we've ever been. And one of the things we've learned to do is to say things like, you know what, I am I had so much caffeine right now. I feel anxious. I just want you to know if I come across as agitated or irritable. It has nothing to do with you. I honestly just had too much caffeine. My mind's making up a story. And we outright, now we've been practicing this for decades. So this is something that like, once you really get it, you got to keep practicing it. We've done it so long that we're both very understanding and we can recognize and say, you know what? It's okay. I'm not taking anything personally. I recognize you feel agitated or I feel agitated. Um, so lead to me, the, some of the most important lessons I ever teach, one of them is that uh, the beginning, middle, end. I think that is a game changer for people. Next time you're anxious, know, oh, this sucks, but it's not the end of the world. I can handle it. There'll be a beginning, middle, end. The next time you're agitated or irritable, instead of pointing your finger at your loved one or someone else or people taking things out of their children, instead go, I feel agitated. My mind wants to make up a story. I don't need to run with the story simply because my mind's making it up. And what I have watched, honestly, Lee, I watch a free, it's a psychological freedom for people to recognize, oh my goodness, I don't have to fight with my loved one. I don't have to have an unnecessary argument because I now recognize I'm simply agitated and irritable and it'll have a beginning, middle, and end. And I don't have to run with that story. Does that make sense? It, makes, it, 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 it makes perfect sense. And I want to mention also that um, I, I've I I did not know the explanation until now what you said, um, you know. But uh, I I have found myself in situations, you know, where I have been mindful, you know, and I have, you know, come to the acknowledgement that I feel irritable for whatever reason biochemically, and I have told the person that I'm speaking with, you know, I I don't feel like myself right now. I'm irritable. I just thought that you should know. You know, and uh, can can we pick up this conversation? You know, a little bit later, that type of thing. You know, so I I, I, I think like, it's did wonderful. You find that that changed it. Sure, it does. Sure, it does. You know, and um, one, it makes you step outside yourself, as you said, to try to determine why am I feeling this way. You know, and mm -hmm. and second, by acknowledging it, I, I think, uh, uh, and and even if you if you trust the people around you, admitting that you, uh, you're you feeling a certain way or you're feeling out of sorts and that type of thing. I think it just helps the communication. Now, uh, I'm going to shift for a second here to uh, uh, to the physical. Dr. Connie, I, uh, you and I spoke before the, our podcast, and I know that you're an athlete and an avid weightlifter. So let's talk for a second about bodybuilding dieting. 
you know, some of our viewers diet for these physique shows uh, so that they can get themselves into great shape. And let's face it, some some people get really angry when they get hungry. You know, we we kid around, we call it hangry. So is there any advice on hangry coping techniques that our viewers might benefit from? Yes, so much. And I've worked with bodybuilders who are um, sometimes some of the supplements they're taking are playing a role in this. That's why mind matching your body is one of the best lessons people can learn. So let's I'll explain hanger and why we're angry. So in the front of our, it just is a over, this is a simple explanation, but I, I like to make stuff make sense. So the front of our brain, if we were doing a brain scan, is the frontal cortex. That's where our higher level thinking, good decision making comes from. But in the middle of the brain, that's the limbic system. That's your emotional center. So here's why this matters. When you're hungry, that is the part of your brain is activated called the hypothalamus. It's activated for hunger, thirst, body temperature, fatigue. So if you're tired. So here's what this means. It's located smack dab in the middle of your emotional center which makes so much sense that when you're hungry, you get agitated, irritable, and you get angry, hangry, thinking it's, it's, and remember, if you don't know that your mind matches your body, when you feel that agitation, irritability, you go, it must be you. It must be this outside event. And so if you could train as meticulously as you do as a bodybuilder, for all the bodybuilders listening, if you can train as meticulously as you do psychologically, whenever the way you do physically, but do this me mentally. Say, you know what? I'm hungry. I'm agitated. I don't have to run with this story. And my mind's racing to make sense out of my body right now. And you practice that. Here's what's going to happen. The very first time you experience it, I, and I've been doing this decades, the very first time you do it, you might get the agitation the irritability going, well, I'm still agitated and I'm still irritable. Yes, you still have that physiological feeling. But if you stick with it, what you're going to see is this. You do not have to be reactive like a puppet to those thoughts simply because you have them. So the next time you feel that agitation, irritability from, from lifting, hunger, whatever it is, I want you to step back and say, I feel agitated and irritable. It's not the end of the world. I can handle it. Those are the two statements I would invite people to say after recognize the hunger. It's not the end of the world. I can handle it. And this is something, Lee, like if I could reach in people's hearts and have them feel this lesson, this isn't a magic pill. Oh, I feel so much better the second I say it. But what you're going to learn, I don't know if you feel better with acid, to be honest. I just, <laughs> but it's not a pill. It's like a, it's a practice. And over time, that practice, you will see a difference. You'll notice that you don't have to be as reactive. So that's a, probably the biggest thing I would have people practice right off the bat. I love that. And, and I, I, I love uh, the idea of people practicing and getting into the habit of saying certain things to themselves, you know, when they encounter these physiological responses from their body and it, it makes them able to understand and handle their emotions better. Let's talk a second about your book, Walking Through Anger. Folks, it's available on Amazon and Audible and I highly recommend that you get it. Dr. Conti, what was the inspiration for your book? So I call it walking through anger because oftentimes we think when it comes to conflict, we think we have to either shut down or get really aggressive. But the truth is we can handle conflict very directly without triggering the fight or flight response. And what I wanted to do with this book, my wife wanted it to be named something else because as soon as people read it, they say it's so much more than anger. And it is. It's how you can handle any intense emotion you feel and how you can help handle other people's intense emotions, whatever they're going through. And essentially it is, the book is about how I take, I always thought, so I was blessed when I was young. Um, I was told about a high IQ and all this stuff. And some of that stuff is, is wonderful. But with that, my parents were very, um, they pushed me very hard to, to read stuff and learn early on at times when I wanted to be doing something else. Right. So, but I remember the first time I read this German philosopher, G.W.F. Hegel, and his writing was so convoluted 
that I thought, I'll never forget this. I was a teenager and I thought, when I grow up, I will never make things this difficult for people. <laughs> and I've literally spent my career taking the most esoteric ideas and breaking them down and make them super easy for people to understand. So with this book, essentially what I've done is I've taken this theory. I developed, I spent my entire career, I created a theory back in 1998. It's called Yield Theory. And it is a, it's about how do you interact with someone, get around their defensiveness, and speak in ways that can be heard, regardless of what you're experiencing, your emotions, or what their experience is. And I, I know we, we talked about this briefly earlier today, which was a lot of people, I've spent my career with people who were mandated to be there. And instead of me saying, well, they don't want to be here, so there's nothing I can do, I always looked at saying, I'm the only person I can control and if the reality is that they don't want to be here, let me meet them where they are, look at the world through their eyes, and then try to make a difference from there. So yield theory, this approach I came up with, is quite literally, if I did an elevator pitch, it's about leading with humility and curiosity to meet people where they are, get around their fight or flight response, and speak in ways that can be heard. And to me, it's about I always envision if I put myself behind the eyes of the person I'm talking to. And so not even just walking a metaphorical mile in their shoes, which is beautiful, but I'm talking about what if I had their, their brain functioning? Their, I always say if I had their level of intelligence, not mine, but theirs, if I had their emotional experiences, their ability to experience emotions and their life experiences, who am I to say I could have done anything differently from what they did? Oftentimes we're like, well, I had it tough and I didn't do that. Yeah, but you had your intelligence. You had your experiences. So what I do is it helps me wipe away judgment for people. And with yield theory, we do a couple things. We set very clear boundaries, but we also throw out judgment. Uh, to me, judgment, it doesn't matter about judgment. What matters is what can you do from this moment forward? So we're always seeking to see what we can do. Um you know this, probably people coming to you for many years, people who are stuck in mental weakness have a tendency to look for why things can't work. Uh, you know, you could tell them what oh, they can't work because yeah. of this, that. Well, mentally strong people, they seek solutions. Right. So in yield theory, we constantly seek, what can you do from this moment forward? And I think what people are going to find with this book, Walking Through Anger, is I the way I told some of those stories, the teaching tales, I tell over a hundred of those little stories, uh, teaching stories in there. I talk about real life experiences from walking onto death row and meeting with people um, to celebrities. So it's a really pragmatic book. I, I feel very proud of this book, the way it came, the way it came out, the way it is. So uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate you mentioning that. I'm a, and I, I read it for Audible as well. So if it's on Audible, I, it, I, I it's a read it's a great that. it's a great book, guys. I I uh, encourage you to pick it up. Now, I've heard you talk about what you call the world of should. Can, can we talk about the world of should and, and not yeah. should, should, shoulding on others? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, I believe it was, uh, yeah, Albert Ellis, I think he said, don't should on people. That's awesome. So I, this is probably, again, one of the top things that I would actually teach people. If I, if I have a moment to teach it. So, again, I feel really grateful that you're asking about these parts. So there is a difference. This is the way I said there are two types of people in the world, uh, people with issues and dead people. I believe there are two worlds that we live in. The first world is um, what I call the cartoon world. And this is our world of shoulds. People should think, feel, believe, and behave the way I think they should. And then there's the real world, how people actually think, feel, believe, and behave. And listen to this. So this will sound simple to understand, but it takes a lifetime to practice. And that is this. As long as you align your expectations with your cartoon world, you're going to be let down when you encounter reality all the time. But when you can learn to align your expectations with reality, you'll have a better chance of actually meeting it there. So there was this land of fools back in the day, and in this land of foolish people, they were really upset because there were all kinds of problems going on in their town. And so they all got together, all the important people got together. And um, so they, they had a meeting to figure it all out. And they made an announcement. They gathered all the people together. And they said, we have figured out all the cause of all our problems. 
the mountains should be a hundred miles closer to us and then we wouldn't have problems and so all the people in the land of fools were like oh you're so wise this is wonderful and they're all cheering and um a little girl came up and she said but since the mountains can't move wouldn't it be better for us to get closer to the mountains rather than demanding that the mountains should be closer to us and it was a land of fools so they're like silly girl she doesn't know anything uh but as silly as it is to demand that mountains should be closer to you rather than you closer to the mountains, honest to goodness, it's the same silliness to believe that other people should think the way you think, believe what you believe, act the way you want them to. And so it's a simple concept, but it is quite literally the, what I believe. I'm almost 50 years old, turned 50 here uh, in a couple of days. Oh, hey, and happy birthday. Thank you. October 17th. Yeah, I'm turning 50. And and what I think is what the one concept that if I could honestly reach into people's hearts and have them understand fully, it is this concept. Because if you can understand, because even though we have a cartoon world, even if you're aware of it, we still have it. Like I created I the, the word cartoon world. I didn't come up with the idea of shoulds. People have been talking about this in psychology for more than a century. But I phrase it as a cartoon world, and I say it that way because as equally as unrealistic as a cartoon is, that's how equally unrealistic it is for um, you to demand other people should be where you want them to be. I, I'll tell you a quick, maybe this story will make, bring a little bit more insight into it. There was this guy, he was supposed to lead a bunch of people up a mountain. And so uh, he, he runs full speed up to the top of the mountain. He gets up there nobody's with him. Like literally they're still at the bottom of the mountain. So he starts screaming at him. Hey, you should be up here with me. I had it tough. I started down there and he's yelling at them, yelling at them, but they can't even see him, let alone hear him. So he becomes known as the fool on the mountain. So if he really wants to lead them, what's he got to do? If he's up there and they're down there, what's the one thing he has to actually do? He got to go down the mountain and meet them where they are. So if, and, and, and people will say to me, all right, doc, like, what's that have to do with me? Well, here's what it has to do with, think about the last time you argued with someone and told them they shouldn't have said what they said. Well, that's cartoon world thought. They did say that. So I say, you shouldn't have said that. So you did say that. What can you learn from it so that you don't make the same mistake in the future? Um, he shouldn't have done this. Well, he did do this. So let's work on the real world from what you did do rather than talk about the world, this cartoon world. And so one of the biggest challenges people have right away is they'll say, well, well, the guy shouldn't have cut me off in traffic. So that's real. No, it's still a cartoon world because he did cut you off in traffic. And so now the question is, how will you respond? If I drive down the road thinking everyone should move out of my way, everyone should drive perfectly the way I want them to. Well, then the moment things don't work out, I'm really upset. Right. But if I align my expectations with reality and do what anybody out there who also rides a motorcycle or remembers that we're taught when we first start riding a motorcycle, which is drive like everybody's going to kill you. And so if you drive with that advice, then you go, okay, this person's looking at themselves in the mirror, but I expect that. I expect that to happen. So you're not reactive. You're not a puppet. So yes, the cartoon world is logical. You might be right, technically right about what your thoughts are. But if it's, if it's not happening, then it's a cartoon world thought. So yield theory is all about meeting people where they are in the real world and moving from there, not saying. So that fool on the mountain, if he had the self-discipline to leave where he was and go meet them where they are, that's what it's about. But most people leave, spend their lives on top of the mountain going, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, you should know what I know. Yeah. I actually got an email from, I hear people all over the world. I had an email from a woman one time, all caps. So if you send an email and all the words in all wow. caps, she okay. like they're yelling, right? Yeah, yeah. She said, I can't believe that everybody is not as mad as I am about the blah, 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 whatever the issue was. So I wrote back to her and I said, so I'm confused. You don't know why everyone else, other people who aren't you, who aren't your, in your life and don't have your life experiences aren't as equally as upset about you, uh, an issue that you are. And she's like, well, if you phrase it that way, 
And I was like, but that's what happened. That's ex- Other that's people ex- who aren't you. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's really interesting because you're, you're touching on a point that I think is just endemic to our society at at, at this point. There, It's like people on different sides of the political aisle you know, think to themselves that everybody else should think the way they think, you know, and it's what creates this divisiveness instead of just thinking to oneself, okay, maybe somebody has a different opinion than I do. And what I, what I need to do is I need to walk a mile in their shoes and see if by looking at it through their paradigm, it's any different. And then I can make up my own mind and I can be civil about it. That's it. That's it. Uh, honestly, that's it. In a nutshell, that's it. So I teach what I call, I call it a box. Everybody does it. They call it the Conti box. It is a concept that is central to yield theory. And that is this. If you take a box, as human beings, we can only ever see one to two sides in a given moment. And so just in the way that we can only ever see one to two sides of a box in a given moment, if I want to know what's on the other side of that box, the only way I can know is if I ask you, let's say that, let's take this metaphor a little further. Let's say the box has screens on each side and they are random images that are shown on that box. So my ego will want to say, well, I've been all around that box. I know what's on every side of it. But the truth is if it's random pictures popping up, you can't possibly know what's going on on that side of the box unless you're actually there. So that means if you're on that side of the box and I'm on this side, I'd have to say, Lee, teach me what you're seeing. What are you seeing from your side? Well, the box to me represents the human psyche. And it's only ego that ever wants to tell us, I know all about the box. I know everybody's side. You don't know everybody's side. That's believing you're omniscient, all-knowing. You're not. So (laughs) with yield day, we say we lead with humility. I lead with the humility of saying, I can see my side of the box. And I'm, I want to know your side. Like, I'm, I'm humble enough to say, I don't know your side. It's only ego that wants to say, I know everything. So I, no, I don't know your side. Teach me your side. And then I'm going to be curious enough to want to know your side. And then here's something really powerful. I thought about this the other day. Let's say you go to a world famous place. Um, like, um, I don't know. Um, I was at a beautiful building once uh, called the Cathedral of Learning in Pittsburgh. It's a beautiful building. There are some, each room in one, on one floor, each room is looks like uh, classes um, from the earliest. Uh, each class represents a different country and what it would look like at a certain time period. A lot of detail. It's beautiful. Okay. But what if the only time you go into that building, you go into the bottom floor, you run in and you got to pee real badly. So you run in, you go in the bathroom. That's the only room of the entire building you see. And then you start thinking, well, this entire, maybe that bathroom's really dirty. So you go, this entire building is filthy and dirty and dumb. And other people who never even saw that bathroom go, what are you talking about? Right. And I think what happens is, Lee, people see their side of the box and they believe that they know the experience for everyone. They they and, they experience reality from their perspective and then extrapolate it to society at large. That's it. They really think their side of the box, they see all sides of the box. Um, uh, you know, I see this with, with people. I told, uh, a, like, obviously, I, I, I told my, my brother, I, got to, I said, listen, I get to talk to Lee. I'm like, so I was so stoked. And... Um, I talked to, um, there was a guy who wrote for um, um, Muscle and Fitness, and this, he's a tremendous like trainer, Marty Gallagher. I'm not sure. He said he was a little younger, but he said um, like he knew of you, and he just, this guy, he said, Lee's one of the nicest human beings you could ever meet. Well, thank and you. And so I was cool because like I already had my image of you before I met you, and then you actually were 10 times even nicer. Thank you. So that was awesome. So I'm just giving this as a glimpse of how I would like take in information. First of all, it was cool because it confirmed what I thought. But let's say somebody met you and they didn't have a good experience. Just because they didn't have a good experience, I wouldn't think, oh, that must be how that person is. I really understand that everybody has their own experiences. And so I hold on to the experiences that I have. And I'm not going to let someone else tell me about, because could you imagine if people... 
And they do. As a public figure, it happens to me. I know it happens to you where someone will judge people based off one little glimpse, one little moment, and they only see even a part of it. But then they make a whole story up about it. Sure. Sometimes and, sometimes people have a bad day, you know, where they right, have they have right. an off moment and they do an off color thing. And, you know, you just can't you can't judge their entire life on that. Exactly. And so I think like I specialize working with people convicted of violent crimes constantly in the prison system. I always tell people who've never been involved in the prison system. Imagine your worst moment of life and it's put into a paragraph and then everyone you ever meet defines you by that worst moment of your life. And that happens. It happens. Yeah. It happens. And so what I won't do is I will never box somebody into that. Like I know no matter what somebody's experience is, I say, okay, so that was your experience. Just because you had that experience, that doesn't mean that'll be my experience. And that doesn't mean that'll be somebody else's experience. And I think that's a good example of taking that box concept to all of the listeners and say, when you encounter people or when you see somebody on TV or you see this and you judge, and you believe you know all about that person, can you set your ego aside and go, no, I saw one glimpse of one part of, you know, what that person was in that moment. And that's it. And I think the more we do that, the more we practice setting our ego aside and genuinely being humble to say, I don't have all the answers. To me, that's a game changer for internal control of our of our worlds. I agree 100 percent. Dr. Conti, where can our viewers find out more information about you? Where can they follow you? So uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's a great free resource. Um, we're actually putting together this. I have a Patreon page where uh, my wife and I are about to do a comprehensive um, couples program boot camp thing together. So there's uh, YouTube is available, and that's just Dr. Christian Conti. Just type in my name on there, and then um, uh, the books on Amazon. Like you said, you mentioned uh, walking through anger. I have a couple books that are just like one to two pages with stories and a lesson. One of them called Life Lessons. Another one's teaching stories. But then I always wanted to have books where you could just flip open to a random page, read a page or two and get something. Um, so I have books like that. I have a book called Zen Parent, Zen Child. Um, for me, being a father is the greatest thing. It's literally the most important thing to me in the world. Um, our daughter's in college now. but Congratulations. So, thank you. Yeah, it's a, she's, she's living peace. Like this, we're just honored to have a front row seat to, her, to watching her life. Wow, this, that's, that's she awesome. She is really one of the most incredible human beings we ever met so zen parent zen child which as the name implies if you want your children to be zen you've got to be zen yourself it comes back to what you and i talked about from the beginning if you're authentic and you live your message so youtube there's amazon and that kind of stuff um and then i have podcasts um i do an emotional management podcast which is like a 60 second clip which is available i think on wherever you get podcasts. And I know some Sirius XM stations play it at like lunch. Do you remember Paul Harvey? Yes. Okay, so I <laughs> love Paul Harvey growing up. The rest of the story. So I do a one minute podcast. It's like a quick story with a lesson. And uh, I, I, I love being able to do that. But I do that because I loved Paul Harvey. And I was like, man, I'd love to do something like that. Well, it, I, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I think I think that you're doing such a wonderful service for people. And I know that you're doing it from the heart. And I know that if, if people uh, will tune in uh, to your podcasts and to your uh, uh, radio messages, uh, they're, they're going to absolutely love you. Man, this has just been great today. I just, uh, I think this is one of the greatest podcasts we've ever had. I honestly, I'm still on cloud nine that I get to talk to you. I just, I am. I say, I, I get to meet people all the time. I'm like, I don't want to sound um, like a, a bumbling person, but I'm like, geez, I'm good. Like I literally had Lee Labrada's picture up and we were like, man, like that's what you want to aim for. And then even growing up, reading interviews and stuff, just seeing how nice you were and genuine you were. I think it's indicative of people who are really great at what they do. They're humble because they don't, they don't need to be, you know, you don't have anything to prove to anybody. Uh, and I think when you have that, you have the opportunity to be humble. So, well, yeah, man, it's a hundred percent honors all mine. I, I'm super grateful. I hope to stay connected with you and anything I can do to be helpful for you. I will for likewise. sure. Likewise. Thank you, Dr. Conti. Much respect uh, and many thanks to you on behalf of all of our viewers. Hey, guys, help us to grow the Lee Labrada show by sharing this podcast with one of your friends. Please leave your comments below. Your feedback will help me to make our shows better. And be sure to hit the subscribe button. All right, you guys. 
Stay motivated, get up and look up. God bless you. The Lee Labrada Show. Thunder from a distant shore. Voices in my head imprison me. Wanna hold